Well, hi everyone, and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Today I'm going to do something a little bit different. Um, having gone over a lot of videos in the Flat Earth community and elsewhere on YouTube, I think that there's a basic misunderstanding of some rather elementary physics principles. So let's head back to school and go over a little physics. Okay, so today we're going to head back to the dining room table and we're going to have a talk about the first and second law of thermodynamics. This is being touted in the flat earth community as a proof against the globe and unfortunately, as we shall soon see, they are completely misrepresenting it. Welcome to my neck of the woods. This is beautiful Grand Traverse Bay in Traverse City, Michigan. Now we have three bodies of water here. Often the distance to the top of the photo is Lake Michigan. On the left is the West Bay, and on the right is the East Bay. They are separated in the middle by the Mission Peninsula where we grow some lovely cherries. Now if you look at the West Bay on the left, you can see that the lake level of that bay is in direct communication and equilibrium with Lake Michigan off at the top. Likewise, the East Bay on the right is in direct communication and equilibrium as far as lake level with Lake Michigan at the top. Since they are both in equilibrium with the lake level of Lake Michigan, we can assume that they are both in equilibrium as far as lake level with each other. This takes us to the zero law of thermodynamics. So if we have a system that is in equilibrium thermodynamically with another system, and a third system that is in equilibrium thermodynamically with that second system, the first and the third systems are in equilibrium with each other. We can represent that visually by saying that system A is in equilibrium with system B. System C is in equilibrium with system B, so therefore system A is in equilibrium with system C. Well, the zeroth law was pretty straightforward. Let's go on to the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics has a couple of parts. The first one is the conservation of energy. Once again, we'll have a look at three systems. Two systems contained within a third. Now, if the total system contains 100 units of energy, system A contains 50 units and system B contains 50 units. If some work is performed to cause system A to lose 10 units of energy to system B, it will end up with 40 units of energy and system B will end up with 60. However, the total amount of energy within system C will still be 100. To put it another way, in the first law of thermodynamics, the books always must balance. Note that in this discussion, we are painting the laws of thermodynamics with very broad strokes. There are fine details that are being omitted. The first law goes on to discuss the different types of energy. We are all familiar with kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion. We're familiar with the concept of potential energy, which is stored energy. And then there is an internal energy of all systems. Uh, this could be, for example, chemical or nuclear energy within the sun, which is a form of potential energy. Finally, we discuss the concept of work, which is the transfer of energy between systems. Well, in the context of thermodynamics, work is considered the transfer of heat as energy. Work is also the movement of mass by force. In thermodynamics, the equation for work is work equals the change in potential energy plus the change in kinetic energy plus the change of internal energy. 
The second law of thermodynamics seems to be the darling of the flat earth community right now. It's very unfortunate that they have a very superficial understanding of this law and they are misapplying it. As we can see in this video, one of the leaders of the flat earth community is making a blatant appeal to authority and then misrepresenting what that authority actually says. In his video, Nathan Oakley touts this lecture from an MIT physics professor on the second law of thermodynamics. After some selective editing, cutting out a key point that this was a closed system example, Mr. Oakley cherry picks this individual phrase in a greater discussion over the second law of thermodynamics about what would happen if a container with a gas was next to a vacuum and the barrier between the two was removed. While he seemed to imply that this meant the atmosphere couldn't exist next to the vacuum of space, he clearly missed the main point of this discussion. While on first blush this looks like Mr. Oakley was attempting to deceive people that didn't know any better, I think I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. After all, I hear he was a theater major. He wasn't uh, a science or a physics major. So let's see if we can help him out a little. Now, the second law of thermodynamics has to do with something called entropy. The common understanding of entropy is that is the tendency of the universe to go from a state of order to one of disorder, a gradation to a uniformity. It also has to do with heat transfer, and we'll have a short discussion of that at the end. Now, in order to understand processes in nature, we have to look at a condition where we have a state one going to a state two via a process A. Now process A can be one of two types of a process. It can be an irreversible process or it can be a fully reversible process. And then we have to look at the reverse of this going from state two back to state one by way of a um, process B. Now, if we have a fully reversible process, the net entropy in this system will be zero because things will be equally as likely to go via process A as they are process B. It just freely spins back and forth with no net gain in entropy and certainly no net loss in entropy. Now, if we have a closed system and an irreversible process, state one will travel to state two via pathway A, and the net gain in entropy will be what it would normally take to bring it from state two back to state one. However, if this is an open system, we can add work and accomplish pathway B and bring state two back to state one. Let's give an example. If I were to put a block of ice on my dining room table in a bucket, heat from the environment would go into the block of ice and melt it, turning it from a solid to a liquid. This is an irreversible process. However, in an open system, I can take that bucket of ice water, I can put it in my freezer. The freezer will do work upon it in the form of the electricity driving a compressor, allowing gas to heat up and then that heat to dissipate into the atmosphere and then expand again to drop the temperature in the freezer and make that ice reform. As a result, the original system, which is the block of ice, has a zero sum of entropy. However, the larger system, which is my house, has got additional heat put into it from the coils on the back of my freezer, and that energy and entropy is dissipated into my house, and the overall entropy of my house goes up to make up for that work that was done on the block of ice. Now let's return to our original problem. 
that of a container of gas next to a container of equal size and volume that has a vacuum in it. Now in this case, state one will be the gas pressure in the left container, and state two will be the resulting gas pressure in both containers when the barrier between the container of the gas and the vacuum is removed. This is an irreversible process, and in a closed system, we will never regain a vacuum, and we will never regain the original pressure that, was, that characterized state one. State two would be an equilibrium at half the pressure in both containers. The resulting change in entropy would be positive, and that positivity would be from the fact that the reverse pathway, pathway B, separating the gas and the vacuum, could not occur in a closed system. However, had Mr. Oakley continued to listen to the lecture, he might have learned that it is indeed possible to have the gas pressure return to the left container and the vacuum return to the right. The way that that could occur is if the system was no longer closed, but was instead open and work from an, from an outside system was applied to it. Specifically, this being in the form of energy being used to drive a compressor, which would suck the air out of the right container and put it all back in to the left container. What Mr. Oakley and the Flat Earth community do not realize is that the second law of thermodynamics, entropy, completely disproves the flat earth. The reason for that is as follows. If the earth was flat in a closed system, covered in a dome for example, and no outside work was being performed on the atmosphere within the dome, the pressure throughout the dome would be equal and fully dissipated with no pressure gradient. The very fact that there is a pressure gradient in the atmosphere implies that an outside force is performing work on the atmosphere. Now that outside force is gravity. And what it is doing is it is performing work on the atmosphere, pulling it downward towards the earth and setting up this pressure gradient. So in fact, although they are touting the second law of thermodynamics as a flat earth proof, it is certainly not helping their case in any way, shape, or form. Now, if you'd like to follow up with this, I actually have the link to the MIT lecture, which is about an hour long, uh, in the description of this video. It's a very detailed explanation of the second law of thermodynamics. You can also see exactly how much effort had to be put in to cherry pick out just that one short six second segment and take it out of context uh, to try and make this some sort of a flat earth proof. There is a third law of thermodynamics and that has to do with absolute zero which is the minimum amount of entropy uh, a system can have is when it's cooled down to absolute zero. But it does lead us into the possible end of our universe, and that is the heat death of the universe. In the example of the block of ice I gave earlier, I said that we could take the ice water and put it into the freezer. That would be cooled by compressing gas and allowing the heat from that compressed gas, which warms up as it is compressed, to dissipate into the house. It is postulated that eventually all the heat in the universe will be dissipated and equally distributed at that point, all processes will end and the universe with it. Science has calculated that this will occur at approximately 4.35 next Tuesday afternoon. So make sure you like and subscribe to my channel before then. Thank you. This rabbit hole's too deep for me.